Please welcome Mary Lawrence, our guest speaker, who will talk about animal protection under current laws. Mary. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I'm just turn that a little bit. Um, so I have a little slide presentation to go along with what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and this first one, be kind to animals. Has anyone, you know, raised with that thought, you know, told by your parents, take care of animals? And we love our dogs and cats, right? Um, and yet there's so much cruelty in our society, so much that goes on behind the scenes that we're not aware of, and it's often referred to as the ghosts in our machine. Um, the violence and the suffering that happens without our knowledge, without our awareness. So that to me was what compelled me to um, submit a proposal for an animal rights committee which was recently passed by the Green Party a couple of months ago. Really excited about it. And um, we just recently elected the co-chairs. I'll now be a co-chair with Craig Seaman from New York. Um, so we'll be getting active. And I'm going to talk to you today about what compelled me to uh, create that proposal for the Animal Rights Committee and what I hope that we can move forward with um, once we get active. But I'll start just with a little bit of the background and the purpose in case you're not familiar with it, just I'm going to read it directly from the proposal. Animals in the United States have inadequate protection by local, state, and federal law. Because of the breadth of issues and challenges facing the Green Party, animal rights issues have not always been sufficiently represented within the Green Party. At the same time, the animal rights movement is growing throughout the United States, especially among young people who are choosing political party affiliations for the first time. And many animal rights supporters are also supportive of green issues. So this potentially can help improve not only the well-being of animals, but also grow the Green Party. And as Ronnie mentioned, this covers the protection of animals in all categories that are subject to some form of human influence, companion animals, exotic pets, farmed animals, both for food and for clothing, laboratory animals, animals in sport and entertainment, endangered, threatened species, and captive wild animals. All of these are important for us to be considering. So I'm going to ask for a little bit of uh, assistance with the slide, the next slide. And I want to talk in this presentation about making those connections, the idea of intersectionality. Unfortunately, in our society, uh, the way things operate, it's about disconnection, keeping us blind to what's really going on. Um, but the intersectional nature is really important to think about when it comes to animal rights. We're interconnected. We're a of social connections um, in categories such as race, class, and gender. They're regarded as creating overlapping and independent systems, which are often of systems of discrimination in our society and disadvantage in a patriarchal society. Many civil rights leaders, past and present, present have maintained for a long time that as one form of oppression, oppression exists, no form of oppression can be completely eradicated whether it's because of the color of one's skin, race, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, physical ability, age, class, or social status. Similarly, many believe that animal rights is a social justice movement of the 21st century. And this is a quote from Cesar Chavez, um, who I also consider a role model. I'm going to read a little bit longer quote from him. Kindness and compassion towards all living beings is a mark of a civilized society. Racism, economic deprival, dogfighting and cockfighting, bullfighting and rodeos are all cut from the same defective fabric, violence. Only when we have become nonviolent towards all life will we have learned to live well ourselves. So next slide. So how many of you have a companion animal at home? Not, not a lot of you, just about half. Okay, or you're just not raising your hands? Okay, um, I have a dog and a cat. I have an animal object to that term. A companion what animal? Do do with the staff. Oh, you're the staff. Okay, the staff of the animals. Okay, all right, got it. So we share our lives with the animals. I have a dog and a cat. Um, so I want you to think about the animals in your lives and how you share your uh, relationships with them. 
as I go through these next few slides in this presentation, which will have, um, I'll go through these thorough, it's not an exhaustive um, presentation. I'm also not going to get sensationalistic with some of the photos. However, they may be emotional as far as the responses. Um, so, yes, think about your relationships. It's a crime to neglect or intentionally abuse a companion animal. However, these crimes are rarely prosecuted, except in extreme cases, such as hoarding or repeated violations involving other criminal activity. Even more rarely do these cases end up in convictions where a defendant serves jail time. And these two photos of a dog named Desmond, who was adopted from the New Haven, Connecticut Animal Shelter in 2012. He was a staff favorite, very lovable, he's a pit bull mix. Um, shortly after being adopted, his body was found dumped in a garbage bag, discarded in the woods of Guilford, Connecticut. He was miraculously identified because he had a microchip, and so they were able to uh, and find that he came from the New Haven Animal Shelter. It was determined that he had been starved and strangled to death by his owner. I attended the 14-month trial where his guardian took a plea bargain for accelerated rehabilitation, which meant no jail time and his record would be wiped clean after just four months of counseling. According to a 2013 Office of Legislative Report, of the almost 3,700 animal cruelty offenses brought to the state in Connecticut from 2012 to 2000, sorry, 2002 to 2012, just 16% were found guilty. And of those 16%, the majority received the AR plea deal. So this was um, an issue that we had been fighting for. I've been working for with a group called Connecticut Votes for Animals to um, pass a law in memory of Desmond. It's called Desmond's Law. And it's a bill authorizing judges to appoint an advocate for the interest of animals in civil and criminal cases involving animal cruelty. So what this means is they'll have an advocate, a legal advocate in court to represent them. Previously, and this just passed the legislature, the House and Senate vote, both voted to pass it. It has not yet been officially signed into law, but we're hoping that it will. Um, and this is a tremendous change, again, over a three year period of really working with our um, representatives to get them to approve it. Similar legislation is pending in Vermont, and also there are, um, as far as other animal cruelty for companion animals, there are two bans that are being proposed in New York and Oregon for preventing the declawing of cats. So if you've ever heard about that, it's not a good thing. It's basically mutil mutilation of cats. Um, so those two bans are being proposed. We need strong federal and state laws that result in criminal prosecution and conviction in order to prevent this type of cruelty. And we need to demand that these types of crimes be taken seriously. So next slide. So also in our um, companion animal realm, we have pet stores. And commercially sourced uh, pet stores, uh, sorry, they commercially source their animals from breeders, often referred to as puppy mills. They breed dogs in intensive basis and in conditions that are commonly perceived to the average person as inhumane. Would you treat your dog like this? Um, this is actually a, these are, you can see this photo. It's an approved USDA facility for breeding operations. Um, the minimum requirements that um, the USDA requires is that the animal must have food, water, and shelter. So these cages can be stacked several on top of each other. Um, there's no padding, no blankie, no squishy toys. Uh, you know, animals pretty much live their whole lives like this. And these are, again, common, and this is acceptable for conditions. Um, currently, 171 jurisdictions in North America have passed bans on strong, or have enacted strong restrictions on retail sales of puppies, kittens, Sometimes rabbits, ferrets, pigs, and other animals considered companion animals. And recently, just in March of this year, the Boston City Council unanimously approved a ban on pet stores selling dogs, cats, and rabbits from breeders like this. And that's an attempt to prevent these types of unsafe conditions. But that's one of very few. Um, in Connecticut in 2015, we had a law that um, really kind of made the regulations more um, 
specific. They um, prevented or increased penalties for violations, improved the state's lemon law, so basically an animal that got sick could be returned, but it still doesn't solve the problem. So we need to prevent this type of inhumane treatment of animals who are bred in these conditions by advocating for stricter USDA oversight and higher quality of living standards in these breeding operations. Okay, next slide. So animal testing and research, another area, again, um, where there is minimal regulation. The Animal Welfare Act, which was uh, signed into law in 1966, is the only federal law in the United States that regulates the treatment of animals in research, exhibition, transport, and dealers breeding animals. But the protections are minimal. And in this photo, you can see it's, um, yeah, very disturbing. And again, these are not the super graphic, gruesome ones. But these are allowed as far as the AWA. On the left is a chimpanzee with um, implants in his brain. And on the right is an animal, a rabbit, with um, her skin exposed in order to test the response of uh, chemicals. Um, again, these are allowed by the AWA, and they're both considered humane. Um, there is a proposed Humane Cosmetic Act, which would make animal testing for cosmetics a thing of the past, and that would end painful and unnecessary tests on rabbits, mice, rats, and guinea pigs. The UK has already banned this practice, but it's allowed in the United States. Um, I'm going to turn to the next slide. As of September 15, 2015, there was groundbreaking legislation in the United States that ended decades of primate research. So um, primates were off, often used in labs to study human type behaviors since they're our closest relatives. But there's no provision in place right now for the over 100,000 animals currently in medical research labs. Um, there's a well publicized case that's uh, in the news right now with two chimps named Hercules and Leo. Anyone familiar with them? Okay, good, so I can share some, a little bit of information. So they were housed at the University of Louisiana New Iberia Research Center for decades. Um, essentially, once this um, law went into place, it was assumed, let's retire them to sanctuaries. But this uh, lab is holding on to them, and basically it's a struggle to get them freed. Stephen Wise of the Non-Human Rights Project and Jane Goodall are among many others who are urging their release to sanctuaries. And there's a proposal for a Humane Care for Primates Act, which would allow the transport of these retired primates to placement in sanctuaries to live out their natural lives. Um, the picture on the right is from uh, a place that's called Monkey Island. And this is a colony of former research lab chimps that were um, from the New York Blood Center. Same thing, they were, no, they were retired, no longer of use, so they were literally just dumped on this island. Um, they had been cared for um, as far as being fed, but the funding ran out, and so now they're just languishing on the island, and there is certainly controversy over what these, the fate of these animals will be and how um, to prevent them from starving. Um, breaking news, this was literally just last night, I was finding out some of this information and a few days ago. Johns Hopkins University just announced that it will no longer use live animals to train its medical students. So it's one of two universities in the country um, that had still used live animals for medical students to train them. And that leaves the University of Tennessee Health Science Center as the one remaining um, research center that has these experiments. The Green Party needs to play a leadership role on this issue and advocate for laws on par with progressive nations such as the UK. And the next slide, um, this is, sorry, this was about the, um, the John Hopkins, Hopkins announcement. We can move on to that next one. So preventing and punishing animal cruelty is also um, one of the concerns. Um, again, think of your dogs and cats. We would never treat them this way. Unfortunately, I've been doing animal rescue and um, working with nonprofits, rescue organizations for the past 15 years, and images like this are very common, and it's disturbing every time, and it's hard to stay positive. Um, but in 2015, 
Senator Dick Blumenthal was a principal co-sponsor of a bipartisan Prevent Animal Cruelty and Torture Act, which for the first time would make it a federal crime to torture and kill animals. Those found guilty would face felony charges, fines, and up to seven years in prison. Starting in January of this year, 2016, animal cruelty is now considered a crime against society by the FBI. So those who abuse animals will be held just as accountable as someone who abuses a human. And these photos, again, these photos are common as far as the types of cruelty that humans do. Again, goes on behind the scenes. We're not aware of it um, unless you do animal rescue. It's unfortunately rare that animal cruelty cases are prosecuted. They're rarely taken seriously by the courts. We need to support bills such as the Prevent Animal Cruelty and Torture Act and advocate stiffer penalties for those who are convicted. There's a strong connection between violence against animals and domestic violence. We therefore also need to advocate nonviolence training and conflict resolution education and network with child protection agencies to address the systemic problem. Okay, and the next slide. And how many of you are familiar with Cecil the Lion? Okay, so this was, you know, several months ago and it was really popular in the news and then it fades away, which unfortunately is the case with many of these issues. They're very, everyone gets stirred up about it and then nothing happens. But there are things that are in progress. Um, the Endangered Species Act uh, was passed in 1973 and it offers federal protection for wildlife listed as endangered. The Captive Wildlife Safety Act of 2007 makes it illegal to move certain types of live big cats across the United, line in the United States with the exception of zoos and cars and circuses. But the transport of the animals as, and what they're often referred to as trophy animals, um, there's not a lot of regulation. So the Cecil Act, it's conserving ecosystems by ceasing the importation of large animal trophies, would make it illegal for trophy hunters to bring back parts of any species proposed or listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Australia has already banned lion trophies, so that's against the law and this would not have happened in Australia. Um, Costa Rica recently banned all forms of hunting. And the UK Green Party also opposes all hunting, which is completely different from what the United States Green Party um, set has a position on hunting. Um, the next slide. So this is another controversy. This year, January 2016, the Yellowstone National Park Service officially began culling 600 to 900 bison and bison considering, you know, the iconic animal of the, um, the West. Allegedly, the reason is to reduce potential conflicts between the park and Montana landowners and also to prevent the transmission of brucellosis to the cattle on um, cattle ranches. But to date, there have been no recorded incidences of wild bison transmitting brucellosis to cattle. Nonetheless, native animal populations like bison and wild horses are routinely rounded up by the Bureau of Land Management and eliminated because they are competition to cattle on free range grazing land. And predators like native wolves are killed by USDA Wildlife Service's sharpshooters and helicopters. And the next photo. The United States Green Party needs to play a leadership role on this issue and join forces with progressive UK Green Party to advocate for strict international laws that protect endangered species and wild animal populations before it's too late. Okay. Animals are exploited for entertainment purposes in circuses, carnivals, and fairs, for racing, dog and cock fighting, and exhibits, among others. Many concerns exist to both the public and the captive animals, including wild animal escapes, mistreatment and abuse, the sale of animals to provide, uh, sorry, to private canned hunt facilities. Is anyone familiar with that is? Canned hunt, where essentially the animals are in an enclosed area and 
hunters are just basically shooting at like fish in a bucket except for their wild animals. Um, also unlawful, and that's fun, that's entertainment. Unlawful animal trafficking, animal drugging, and much more. So in this, um, oh sorry, go to back because I'm going to describe those photos. We can go back. Thank you. Um, in these photos, the top right is a baby elephant, and this is just a common practice for how elephants are trained with restraints and bull hooks. And there have been uh, proposals for legislation to eliminate bull hooks, but I personally think that's just a small piece of the problem. It's about the exploitation of animals that should not be treated this way to begin with. Um, and the bottom right, um, what sometimes happens is teeth are removed of the animals, so these lions and tigers have no teeth. And on the left, this was um, a case over the summer of last year, the Missouri State Fair was um, exhibiting tigers, which were referred to by people seeing them as skeleton tigers. Essentially, they were so emaciated uh, and so unhealthy that people were concerned that they were just, again, being inhumanely tre treated, but this was still allowed. No, ten minutes. Okay, 10 minutes, I can do it. Okay, um, a recent announcement uh, this year, Ringling Brothers, the largest traveling circus, held its final shows featuring elephants, which they say will now be retired to the company Center for Elephant Conservation in Florida. But I do have to say that retired in quotes because the animals are not going to be giving, giving wild range. They have 30 acres, and this is like animals that could roam 20 to 30 acres in a day. Uh, I mean, 20 to 30 miles in a day, sorry. So top right there, has anyone heard of Tyke, the elephant outlaw? Um, in 1994, Tyke um, was a circus elephant for Ringling, and she broke free from her enclosure and trampled several people to death. Um, Hawaii is now poised to be the first state in the nation to ban all wild animals and circuses entirely. Seventeen countries have already banned wild animals and circuses. I won't read them all, but there are seventeen of them. Um, there's also a ban on the use of wild animals and circuses being considered in England, Scotland, and Wales right now. The United States Green Party needs to play a leadership role on this issue and join together with these progressive nations in banning wild animals from circuses. I have the next slide. Dog fighting is a felony in all 50 states. However, again, it's rarely prosecuted unless there are other unlawful activities such as um, drug use and other crimes. Pit bulls, unfortunately, are the most common breed, but they are not vicious by nature. They're trained to fight this way. One of the most well-publicized cases, of course, involved NFL quarterback Michael Vick. Anyone familiar with that case? Um, he was convicted of dog fighting in 2007, served 21 months in prison for fighting dogs as well as shooting, electrocuting, and hanging dogs to death who did not perform well. Um, although he did serve his time, his sentence was minimal in light of these heinous crimes. As with all forms of animal cruelty, we need to advocate stiffer penalties for those who are convicted and work with state and federal agencies to address the systemic problem of domestic violence. So as if all this wasn't bad, we get to farm animals, uh, bad enough, we get to farm animals who are among the most abused of all animals. The Federal Animal Welfare Act does not protect cold-blooded species, so that's chicken and other birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish, etc., which represent about 58 billion animals killed for food in the United States alone every year, 10 billion of whom are land animals, and about 9 billion of them are, are uh, birds. In addition to the AWA, two other federal laws, the Horse Protection Act and the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act are the only other laws, and they offer minimal standards of welfare for horses and farmed animals during transport. And this is a picture of gestation crates, which is common practice used by um, farmers who raise uh, pigs. The pregnant sows go in there so that they will not supposedly trample their young. Um, but these crates are completely inhumane. They spend their, pretty much their entire lives that way. And they're banned in the European Union, Sweden, Canada, and nine states in the United States. And right now we have, on the next slide, 
a 2016 ballot initiative in Massachusetts that would curb these extreme confinement and lifelong immobilization of animals at industrial style factory farms. The measure will ensure that certain farm animals are able to stand up, lie down, turn around, and extend their limbs by phasing out the extreme confinement of breeding pigs, veal, veal calves, and egg laying hens. So I highly recommend, if you're interested in this issue, please sign that ballot there that they have, um, or the, the form, the Massachusetts Citizens for Farm Animal Protection. Yes, the United States Green Party needs to play a leadership role, not just banning these cruel practices on factory farms, but also to pay attention to how animals are treated. And you can turn to the next slide, because there's really very little difference between a factory farm, quote, factory farm, and a free range or cage-free operation. Photo on the left is factory farm chickens. Um, again, remember those dogs in the puppy mills that are in cages, one on top of the other? That's pretty much how the chickens are housed. Um, they can't move around their six to a cage. So then you think, oh good, let's make their lives more humane, let's get rid of the cages. Well, on the right, that's the cage-free operation. Pretty much the same intensive confinement. And just imagine the noise, imagine the smell. Has anyone ever been trapped in an elevator for like five minutes? So imagine spending your entire life trapped in an elevator. And if you go to the next slide, remember Hurricane Katrina. Imagine if you were trapped in the Superdome and your life was like that for your entire life. People that experience that never want to live that way ever again. And that's how animals are treated even in cage-free operations. And then you also have to think again, whether it's factory farm or cage-free or organic, all baby chicks are de-beaked. That's to prevent them from pecking each other to death or getting into fights. All male chicks are killed because they serve no purpose to the egg industry. And all broilers are killed when they're just a few months old. So they're just babies. They're not living their entire natural lives. There's nothing natural about that process. In the picture on the right, in the common way to dispose of the male baby chicks, there's three things. One, they just put them in garbage bags and let them suffocate. Two, they gas them in these mass uh, gas pits. Or three, they just bury them alive. And this is the process of somebody just shoveling baby chicks into um, a dumpster where they'll suffocate. You can turn to the next one. So all of those photos that I've shared have been the response or have been the result of animal activists who take it upon themselves to expose the truth. The egg, meat, and dairy industry are concerned because we're exposing the lies that they try to hide. Again, the ghosts in the machine that are part of our daily lives. The New York Times food columnist Mark Bittman coined the term ag gag to refer to state laws that forbid the act of undercover filming or photography of activity on farms without the consent of their owner. Because it's against the law to even go into one of these facilities, but to have your camera, that's a federal offense. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, or AETA, was passed in 2006 in response to then ongoing prosecution of members of Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty, also known as SHAC or the SHAC 6. They're an activist group that worked to close animal testing laboratories at Huntington Life Sciences by staging demonstrations, leafleting, doing undercover videos, website campaigns, and other forms of protest. Again, getting the information to the general public, which is what we do with our First Amendment rights. The lone dissenting statement for this law was written by Dennis Kucinich who said the bill was written in such a way as to have a chilling effect on the exercise of the constitutional rights of protest. The Center for Constitutional Rights believes that the AETA, quote, unlawfully criminalizes constitutionally protected activity in the name of corporate profit is one small part of a large corporate and government agenda to constrain social activism and exploit the public sphere of terrorism." Unquote. 
The AETA infringes on civil liberties and First Amendment rights of free speech. Activists who in investigate the horrific conditions that animal industries hide from the general public should be given the same protection as whistleblowers who expose corruption and not be treated as terrorists. Okay, next. So there's a strong movement now for the, the rights of animals, and that's again one of the motivating factors in forming the Animal Rights Committee. Based on the principles set forth in the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness that was publicly proclaimed in a 2012 philosophy conference at Cambridge University, numerous countries, states, and provinces, with New Zealand being one of the most well-known, are taking the lead on defining non-human animals as sentient beings, changing their status from property to person, thus granting them rights and protections under the law similar to human beings. Animals feel love, joy, surprise, excitement, fear, sadness, anger, frustration, pain, and suffering. They nurture their baby, babies and grieve the loss of friends and family members just like we do. Animal rights is a social justice issue and the progressive legal community is beginning to recognize that. The nation's leading social justice law journal, the NYU Review of Law and Social Change, recently published a piece in support of animal rights for the first time in their history. In 2015, the Oregon Supreme Court ruled that any animal can be treated as a legal victim in a case, affording animals more basic rights to protect them from abuse. The majority of people in the United States support this type of progressive thinking, often considering of their dogs and cats as members of their family rather than things. And there's a Congressional Animal Protection Caucus, a bipartisan group of U.S. representatives that was formed in 2015 to promote and advance humane animal welfare laws. And the Green Party Animal Rights Committee aligns itself with this legal position in order to establish the leadership role in animal protection policy making. So as I mentioned already, I've been involved with animal rescue and activism, and I've been a vegan for the past 18 years. I'm motivated primarily by animal ethics, but also environmental concerns and social justice issues for farm workers and slaughterhouse employees. The conditions that exist on 99% of animal farms in this country are deplorable for animals, for the people, and the planet. The policies in place primarily protect large-scale operations at the expense of both domestic farmed animals and surrounding wildlife, which are considered a nuisance. Animal agriculture destroys the greater ecosystem through toxic runoff that contaminates groundwater, promotes algae blooms that kill fish and other aquatic life, pollutes air quality and destroys native plant habitats that are essential for pollinators like bees and butterflies, which have subsequently have had their populations decimated at alarming rates. And they contaminate nearby communities who are often socioeconomically disadvantaged and disenfranchised. Animals are routinely and callously abused in laboratories, on farms, for food and clothing, for entertainment, for profit, and merely for pleasure. These are all examples of systemic violence which must be addressed. The animals need us to protect them, and we owe it to them to be their guardians. And one more, another quote from Cesar Chavez, and I'll give you the longer quote. We need in a special way to work twice as hard to make all people understand that animals are fellow creatures, that we must protect them and love them as we love ourselves and that the basis for peace is respecting all creatures. We cannot hope to have peace until we respect everyone, respect ourselves and all living beings. We cannot defend and be kind to animals until we stop exploiting them. Exploiting them in the name of science, exploiting them in the name of sport, exploiting them in the name of fashion, and yes, exploiting them in the name of food. One more slide for you. And another one of my dog and cat. Um, <laughs> that's Boo Bear and Gremlin, who show that with much patience and a lot of positive reinforcement, even a dog that is a prey drive that wants to go after kitties can be trained to live successfully and um, 
peacefully with a kitty. Um, so I have information there if you'd like more uh, to do some research on your own. I highly recommend visiting um, the Coalition for Animals and voting for that ballot when it comes on the ballot in November. And um, I can talk to anyone if we have any time after, if you have any questions. And I also have cookbooks if anyone would like to learn more about vegan cooking. So thank you very much.